I'm Charles Cotton and I came to Cambridge in 1983 to work for Clive Sinclair and it's obviously been very sad in the last week when uh, he's no more with us and uh, he was one of the um, people that created the entrepreneurial scene in Cambridge and he was an entrepreneur before there were any other entrepreneurs around Cambridge. He was very much somebody who came up with his ideas, put his money behind them and uh, made them successful and uh, that was, uh, he was an inspiration for me as he has been for lots of other people in Cambridge. Thank you very much for, for coming along today. Um, as you say, uh, sadly, uh, Sir Clive Sinclair passed a few days ago. Um, and this is just a chance for us to discuss um, your involvement uh, with Sinclair. Um, uh, you spent about three years at Sinclair, yes. is that right? Exactly. Um, about 83 to 86. Exactly. And, and your memories of, of Clive. Yeah. Well, I, I first met Clive when he gave me um, rooms in his house in Maddingley Road and in the Stone House mm -hmm. and I stayed there for about three months when I first uh, worked at Sinclair because I was moving down from Lancashire where I'd been involved oh, in the motor industry with uh, Leyland Truck and Bus Division of all places and uh, so he um, he gave me a room in uh, in the Stone House and that was so amazing so I I had breakfast with Clive from time to time and that in itself was an amazing experience that's fantastic so so you um, did you uh, apply for this this job at Sinclair or did were you no, I, I, well I was approached uh, uh, as a result of um, a guy called Jeffrey King, who was a headhunter in, in Cambridge, right. who had uh, recruited a good friend of mine called John Graham. John Graham and I worked at Truck and Bus Division of British Leyland uh, back in the uh, 1980s. And uh, uh, they, I had a picture of uh, on the front of Marketing Magazine. And uh, John saw this and said, ah, I understand that Clive's looking for someone on international sales. This is a guy who's done international sales for Leyland. Um, maybe he'd be an interesting character for them to meet. So I went through an interview process with, with Jeffrey King and then met up with Nigel Searle. Right. Uh, and uh, Nigel and I really hit it off from the word go and we're still good friends today and that's been amazing so uh, and I was recruited to run the international sales side of uh, of, um, of Sinclair and I remember saying to my wife I said she was a bit worried about uh, Sinclair because you know she'd done a bit of background looking and they sort of seen the various uh, uh, developments that have gone on mm. in, uh, in St. Ives and so on and so forth I said well look if it lasts three years, that would be great. And I just want to do it because I want to change away from what I'm doing mm -hmm. into this exciting new world of computing. Yeah. And uh, that was, and I, and I was almost exactly right with my three years. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And, and you know, it, it's something you, you know, you've got on the CV as it were now, and it, it, it took you forward Absolutely. into those other Well, it took me out of the motor well. industry into what I, we would call high tech, yeah. and that, that's amazing. And that's, of course, was part of the fundamentals of Cambridge. Yeah. And you know, Absolutely. Clive is one of the key, if not the key figure in the uh, computing style in the last 50 years, yeah. uh, and he was amazing. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Yeah. So you got the job, yeah, um, <laughs> and then, but you didn't have anywhere to stay because you were relocated yep. to Devon, that's right. So, so how did it come about that you I, would I don't would remember stay? precisely, but I think that um, Nigel was talking to Clive, and Clive said, oh, well, I've got plenty of room in the, in the uh, in Maddingley Road, you can come and stay with me. So that's how it was. And now we didn't meet up that often at breakfast because no, no, he uh, used to go off running yeah. in the mornings. And so he would go off nice and fresh and come back all sweaty <laughs> and we'd have breakfast together and so And it wasn't, a, wasn't an easy breakfast because Clive very much wanted to talk about technology. Right. And in particular, he wanted to talk about batteries in those days because okay. he had the, the, uh, the, the new television that, yeah. uh, that he 
been involved with for some time, and he made the the concept of changing the cathode ray tube from sort of x to y to x round the corner to yeah, that, yeah. that way, and Bending so, it. yeah, which made a very much more compact television. So, uh -huh. uh, and he was interested in batteries in those days. I didn't know anything about batteries because right, okay. batteries wasn't something I was concerned. I had lead acid batteries in Leyland, but uh, you know, <laughs> anything else was beyond my ex uh, my uh, capabilities. But he was very much in to those and uh, he um, he that's what he wanted to talk about was batteries right <laughs> lithium ion for, for breakfast. well no a long time before <laughs> that even because right. we we use in the event in the uh, in the flat screen television we used polaroid batteries yes. that were in polaroid cameras yep <clears throat> which was Brilliant because they were very flat. Very flat, yeah. weren't they? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I've got a few at the museum. <laughs> so you 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 sit down and and and, and there's Clive at, at breakfast, yeah. um, chatting away about yeah. batteries and things. It, uh, that's a, that's a strange breakfast. Absolutely. Well, one of the first things he was concerned about was that the sales in Japan weren't what he wanted them to be. So I was dispatched off to Tokyo right. to uh, um, have a chat with Mitsui, actually to fire Mitsui, <laughs> right. which was an interesting experience as somebody who had never been to Japan before, uh -huh. going over to talk to one of the biggest companies in the world and tell them that they were no longer welcome to um, sell ZX81s. So I duly set off and uh, got to Japan, went into this enormous building in Tokyo. Mm -hmm. And uh, there I was on the top floor of this Mitsui Tower. And uh, there must have been 20 people around there. There was, there was somebody who could speak English and Japanese. Right. Uh, and in my own polite way, I tried to say that they had failed to meet our expectations and we didn't we wanted to cease our relationship with them. They would probably use those terms rather than saying that you're fired. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. <laughs> and uh, they they went off into huddles and so on and said, Oh well that was very interesting. Thank you very much for coming to see us. So <laughs> <laughs> right, that was it. Yeah. And then two and a half years later, they decided they would um, give up uh, and no longer represent Sinclair in, in Japan. <laughs> two and a half years later? Yes. Right, okay. <laughs> so did you find another distributor? In, yeah, in, we that? did, but right. it, wasn't, it wasn't successful. Right. And that was one of the problems that we had with Asia, frankly, is that, uh, you know, because uh, shortly after that, I went over to China. And uh, because again, you know, China was a, a huge market and uh, uh, there was an expectation that they were interested in computers. So mm -hmm. I went over mm -hmm. there and uh, saw lots of factories and all the factories were identical. They were six stories high, mm -hmm. all the raw materials were taken up in the elevator to the top floor and then they were taken down. And then yeah. one thing I remember most of all was that um, there was a huge wave soldering machine in all, all of these. They were all provided, I think, by the French or the Germans or something. And they were all still in their plastic wrapping. And oh, really? all they, there were all these benches with mainly young women soldering these uh, these uh, electronic devices together. All by so, hand? Yeah, all by hand, yeah. So I was in Guangzhou, which is in this sort of southwest corner of, uh, of China. And uh, met a lady um, called Kathy Flowers, I think was her name, and she was uh, on television in China uh, teaching English. Right. And so we decided that this was a great idea because you know computers would be a very good aid for for that. Mm -hmm. And so we kind of built this relationship. I wrote a. Um, uh, I took about uh, two hours to write a. Uh, the, Two-page agreement with these uh, uh, with these Chinese companies, and um, uh, I gave it to them. And then about thirty-six hours later, they came back with sort of like forty pages right, in right. Chinese, which right. I didn't understand at all. So we didn't make it a, a great success of China in those days. But right. it could have done because I think that um, you know learning uh, computing would be a good way of. Uh, Teaching English, yeah. and that's what this young lady was uh, was, and having being on television would be a very good way of doing it. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. So there's no thought of changing the character sets so that it could not represent at that stage. The, the, no, no, um, we didn't get we didn't get that far. Right, <laughs> but okay. it was very much the concept was to learn English. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah so you didn't need yeah, to. Yeah, right. so interesting. Uh, yeah, the next thing I did was to go to Australia because um, again uh, we had the same distributor in Australia that. Acorn had, mm -hmm. and uh, that was not viewed very well by Clive, who was thinking, <laughs> well, why does this 
Julian Barson want to cover both companies, you know. <laughs> and uh, so I went out to Australia to try and persuade Julian Barson that there was, wasn't a good idea. I failed on that too. Right. Uh, <laughs> so, uh, so I had I had three countries where I had fairly signal failures in my first <laughs> few months with Clive. <laughs> but you stayed there for longer. So, uh, you yes, know. I know. Yeah. Uh, well, we had lots of successes in right. Europe. <clears throat> good, good. <clears throat> That's an interesting thing because the, the Spectrum, well, all, all the, the Sinclair yeah. products are, are thought of to be very British products, um, of which they are. But actually, they, they did do a lot of business around the world. Absolutely, yeah. Well, so, Bill Sinclair, who was Clive's dad, mm -hmm. was a lovely guy who had the job of uh, international sales. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, I got to know Bill quite well. And we used to chat about things and so on. He, um, he was very good at talking. He wasn't very good at doing in terms right. of getting things done. Uh, but he was just a lovely guy to, to work with and, and to speak to. So, uh, but we, majority of our sales were in Europe. And uh, with a single exception that we also had um, a, a, an arrangement with Timex in, in the United States. Mm -hmm. so Timex Sinclair did their own version of the Spectrum. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, that's something which Nigel Searle, who was the uh, chief executive at the time when I joined Sinclair, um, was very much behind. And uh, unfortunately, the Timex Sinclair was not the success that we thought it would be. Commodore was the number one in, mm. uh, in America at that time. And so we got to the point where Timex were getting a bit fed up that they had uh, the, they were making these Timex Sinclair products mm -hmm. and not getting any success. So one morning, um, Nigel Searle and I flew on Concord to uh, nice. New York and went off to see um, Timex. And uh, as a result of that, we had, oh, I don't know, several tens of thousands of Timex Sinclair products, which I had the job of uh, uh, selling on. Uh, right. And fortunately, I was able to do that through a South American distributor that we had. <laughs> And so we managed to sell all these Timex Sinclair products into, I know, various um, South American countries. <laughs> <coughs> Interesting. Yeah. So it, it, it does, it kind of surprises me that, that well, it doesn't surprise me, but it, it is interesting because, you know, it, it does seem, uh, yeah, the UK is such a small company and the, and the country. Yeah. Um, and, <coughs> and with Sinclair being that, that British thing, but actually it really did get around the world and the sales, Absolutely. you know, ultimately and, were And all were of huge. the things like the, um, the computer magazines and so on were translated into all of these languages that mm -hmm. weren't in English. Um, and you know, I'm sure in the, in the museum here, you've got lots of uh, records of uh, them in, in French and uh, so on. But they were yep. also in Japan, in Chinese, and in in uh, Spanish for South America and also for Spain. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. So you know, it was it was much much bigger than just being in the UK. Yeah. Would you say the sales, um, you know, around the world uh, were much bigger than they were in the UK? No, they ultimately? weren't. They were about the same. They were about the same. So yes, about 50, the same 50, number. Right, yes, about fifty okay. fifty. Yes. Right. And uh, in the last year, when we were d dependent upon the spectrum, the sales internationally were bigger than the sales in the UK. Right. Yeah. Okay. So one of the machines we have at the back there is the Investronica uh, version yeah. of the ZX Spectrum. So that was uh, that, available in Spain. Yes, right? it was. Yeah. yeah. Well, we uh, we had a relationship with the a company called El Cotinglés, who were the distributor there. And they were a wonderful company. They were a little bit like John Lewis in this in this country. They right. had huge um, garment manufacturing facilities and mm -hmm. so on. And uh, they decided they wanted to have a, uh, a uh, Spanish language uh, computer. And so they um, they decided that uh, we would come up with an agreement where they would do a uh, a ROM and a, a um, Spanish language keyboard right. for that which which you say in is the uh, is the result of that yeah. and we had a lovely relationship with them yeah we had some I'm, I'm probably off subject now but I remember on one occasion before we finalized this deal to do the Spanish keyboard I was in a boardroom there and of course my my Spanish was almost non-existent, and I was very dependent upon one of the uh, the guys from in Astronica who was uh, called Juan Celabona, lovely guy, and uh, <clears throat> uh, we were having this discussion, and uh, then suddenly one of the two guys that was running El Cot Inglés, who was a big guy, you know, but like a sumo wrestler, <laughs> you know, reached across the table. I'm thinking, oh, he wants to shake my hand. So I brought my hand out like this. He got me around the throat. 
I, for what was reason? Obviously, I said, what is this about? You know, <laughs> you know. <laughs> and he said, oh no, it's a mistranslation. He said he misunderstood what you said. <laughs> That's a hell of a mistranslation. <laughs> so we went off. A, Cost we, you went, your life. we went off for dinner that night, and uh, we went off to an old place in a, an old, old Madrid is a wonderful place, mm -hmm. and we went to this restaurant, and uh, he, the, this guy that was uh, the, the, the brother of the uh, two people that ran El Cotting Glaze in those days, um, had a had an older brother, and he said, "I want to go somewhere where my brother's not, because we don't really meet." together very often. Anyway, we went into this re restaurant and of course his brother was at another <laughs> table. So we got this sort of huge number of people all chatting mainly in Spanish together and so on and me sitting in the corner and thinking, you just this, around. this is kind of special, you know, because it was a wonderful experience. Yeah, yeah. 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 Fantastic. <laughs> going uh, back, back to, to uh, yeah, I don't want to keep going back to the breakfast, but I, that's, that's um, kind of amazing to me. I mean, yeah. was, was breakfast uh, always about business or? Oh, yes. It, yes. Yeah. I, I, cause that was what Clive, it was, it was about business, but it was more about technology. Cause yeah, that was right. where Clive felt most comfortable. Yeah, yeah. He really wanted to talk about technology. And I, not being an electronics yeah. guy, was struggling a lot. So right. I ended up talking to him a lot about distribution mm -hmm. and setting up uh, companies internationally and so on. And I could see, the equivalent of a glazed expression coming over time <laughs> in those days. So, so he wasn't so interested no, in any of that? No, not at all, no. He no, was no. totally interested in the, in the technology and that's where he, he was most comfortable. Yeah. He yeah. had a, he had Makes the sense. ideas and, uh, yeah. that's what he wants. And of course, Jim Westwood was his right hand man for the technology side. So, you yeah. know, Clive would have something on a piece of paper as a literally give it over to Jim. And uh, as far as Clive was concerned, he'd already sold a gazillion. <laughs> yeah. Right. In Clive's part. Just instant you know. success. Yeah. It must be. How could it, it fail? Yeah. No, exactly. No, and no, that was, that's quite wonderful. And he had a, a tremendous track record with the, uh, with his radios, with his mm -hmm. hi-fi and, uh, with his, uh, instruments, with the, uh, with the calculators and so yeah. on. So he had a track record there of huge success. Yeah. Yeah. Especially and, the calculator. Oh, know, yes. The absolutely. Uh, Sinclair executive. Oh, it was beautiful. Yeah. Um, and he had, he absolutely believed in advertising. Yeah. And selling off the page of advertising was one of the things that I learned about that right. uh, he did really well. So, you know, we spent a lot of time with the advertising agencies, you know, making sure that every single word was appropriate for right. that particular theme and mm -hmm. so on. He cared about that a lot. That right. was for Clive, it was less about marketing, it was absolutely about advertising. <clears throat> right. Interesting. Yeah. Interesting. Can you, can you expand on that a bit? That was a, that's an interesting phrase. Yeah. Obviously, advertising is one of the ingredients within the marketing yeah. mix. Uh, but that was the one that he, he absolutely believed in because all of his experience with the, with the earlier products in his uh, stage, you know, with his micro radios and so on yeah. and so forth. Yeah. There were two themes that, or several themes that, uh, that Clive had. One was off the page advertising, you know, mm. get the text right on the page because you knew that the enthusiast was going to pour over every single word in there and take it. Oh, yeah, I understand. Yeah, get, it. And they really read the advertising. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Uh -huh. yeah, very deeply. And the second thing that, I, that Clive absolutely cared about was cost the, and yeah. price, because he always had a price point. It always had to be $24.95, $99.95, $149.95 or something. So he absolutely believed that there were these price points which had to be hit. Mm -hmm. And then he wanted to build the product uh, uh, that was going to make money out of those. So, you know, he was always paring away the cost of those yeah. products Save to, every to a detriment of some of the products, of course. But, mm -hmm. you know, he, that was where he was successful. Yeah. <clears throat> Size was another area. Miniaturization oh, yes, absolutely. was a huge area. <laughs> totally, yes. That was, and they, they went together. And uh, so, you know, he didn't actually have old scales in his office, but he was the sort of guy who you could imagine. And we, we, past the BBC on the way into this interview today. And mm. I said, that's a big lump. Yeah. And I said, if Clive had done that, he would have weighed it and said, this is so over cost. Uh, yeah. <laughs> and because, you know, you weigh the, uh, the, the ZX80 or the ZX81 and mm. they were featherweights. Yeah. And there was almost no content within them. And mm. there was just enough to make them work. Yeah, absolutely. 
it's it's interesting because you know there, there are i mean there's no right way to do these things but one of those ways um in terms of starting to design a product is to you know set the specification for it in terms of price yeah. its functionality mm -hmm. and, and things um the other is to design the perfect product and then it comes out at the price it does and that's the way it is yeah. um <clears throat> Plyver's obviously all about you know setting the spec for it to a certain extent um yes. uh, and uh, but but the price is always the, yeah. the, the the big important <clears throat> part so you could have that headline price up there that was because it's it's interesting if you take um uh, the computers that were, were out at the time, mm -hmm. things like the Commodore PEP, um, the Tandy TRS-80, things like that, you know, these were hundreds of pounds. Yes. Um, in some ways, you could, you, one train of thought would be to say, well, all you needed to do would be a hundred pounds cheaper than them. And, you know, you've, you've got a product. But it was sub one hundred pound. No, you know, it was and, and, so far cheaper and than anything probably else. Probably a little bit ahead of his time. Um, he was in that divide by 10 school. He said, you know, if something costs a thousand pounds, then you've got sales for 10. If it costs a hundred pounds, you've got sales for hundreds of thousands, yeah, you yeah. know, because th that's the way it is. There's, mm -hmm. a, there's a pyramid. Yeah. And uh, he and always wanted to get to that low price because he understood that that would uh, appeal to people. Absolutely. And if you look at how that's affected people in the UK, mm -hmm. and it became something that mainly schoolboys, but also schoolgirls wanted to have as yeah. their Christmas present was a, was a Sinclair computer. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. You know, and it, they, it, it was affordable, whereas the BBC was, mm, a little bit of towards well beyond the top there's end. There's a lot of money. Yeah, yeah. I mean, if you t if so, if you take these things into consideration now, you know, the the hundred pound for the ZX80 mm -hmm. was the equivalent of four hundred pounds ish today. Yeah. Um, the BBC Micro at, at uh, three nine nine, um, you know, that's that's twelve hundred pound ish yeah. today. Yeah. Um, you know, they they yeah, there was a huge price yep. differential there, and and it is, I guess, the reason. That, that everybody considers that, that Clive brought computing to the masses because it was so much cheaper than uh, than anything else that was around. Absolutely. Um, <clears throat> and although it wasn't necessarily, we think of a hundred pound as just being a kind of throwaway amount of money. It wasn't because mm -hmm. back then that was a lot more money. Yes. Um, but it was still, you know, affordable to to some people or to, to many people. And that's what got it out there. That's what it got it hand in in the hands of a generation. Yeah. That is later <clears throat> on going to become. The programmers and the, the next big, you know, business yeah. and entrepreneurs I, and the uh, future. Clive, in his way, is an inventor. Yeah. He is very much an inventor. He's the person that opened up opportunities for people and gave them, you know, a low cost way of understanding what computing was about and technology was about and so on. And that I think is why Britain these days is so far ahead of for Europe mm -hmm. in terms of its entrepreneurialism. Mm -hmm. it's, um, it all traces back to, to Clive and to a lesser extent, I would say that, uh, Acorn. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's just upset a lot of people on YouTube. There's going to be comments I below. I, I do know that. No, 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 no. Well, it's good. I, Keep and doing of course, it. I, I, <laughs> I'm very, very good friends of, uh, uh, of Herman Hauser. So uh, Herman and I were arch eminers at one stage with, and Chris Curry. Um, but we, yeah, I love, I love them all they're great people slightly off topic but did you know that, that you and herman were one of the the first people from cambridge that had come to see the museum in in Hale? all oh, right so I, yeah well i, I, I remember that day yeah. to, no to i this remember day. you you um, got in touch with me and i said uh, you know herman we've got to go over because yeah. i think we'd both seen the uh, computer museum in um, in america mm. and thought wow that, that we could do the same thing mm. here and you you had all of the what early stages mm. of, uh, of what exists here today and yeah. uh, that was uh, yeah we're, we're, we're still yeah. on that journey but <laughs> no um, it's yeah. good and uh, you know i've um, i've uh, suggested that there are premises in cambridge mm. that would be much more accessible for uh, the, the the tourists mm. and uh, there's every reason why people should want to see the Cambridge Computer Museum. No, absolutely, <clears throat> absolutely. In terms of, of, of Clive, on, on a personal note now, yeah. we, we know in terms of uh, his, his uh, temperament, um, <laughs> sometimes he was a bit shouty, um, but uh, uh, I've got so many stories of people saying he was just the, the nicest, uh, most generous person. Absolutely. Uh, uh, Ruth Bramley had mentioned about uh, the Fortnum and Mason mm -hmm. hampers. Um, did you get one of those? I at, certainly at did, yeah. Right, fantastic. No, it was, and you're, you're right. He was 
incredibly generous, apart from giving me accommodation in the Stone House. Mm. Um, mm. When I was looking to move down to Cambridge and was looking to sell my house uh, in Lancashire um, and having some difficulty, he said, well, we'll, we'll, bridge, we'll provide bridge finance for you. And right. so now I didn't use it, but that gave me the confidence to uh, have my house in Lancashire auctioned, which yeah. was very, it turned out very successfully. So, yeah, but brilliant. it was giving me the the confidence that I had his backing. That was amazing, and he, no, he was an incredibly generous guy. Yeah. Um, and uh, you know, just talking about uh, Clive, and uh, this may be uh, off subject, but uh, you know, Clive's parents. Uh, you know, Bill was a, was a wonderful guy. His mum was a difficult lady, right? <laughs> and uh, if you'd met her, you would understand what I mean, and yeah. so on. Uh, and you can understand how Clive, being the product of m his mum and dad, ended up being the person who he was. Yeah. You know, yeah. both irascible and incredibly generous. Yeah, no, absolutely. Rodney Dale wrote a book yeah. uh, uh, I, about Sinclair, and I, I spent a lot of time with yeah. Rodney chatting. Um, as you do, and he was telling me you know, about that, the family and how it was, you know, quite an argumentative um, and very forthright, um, very yes. open discussions they would have. Um, and you absolutely can see that going through. Absolutely. Uh, with Clive. But yeah. at least you knew where you stood. Yeah. You know, that they, there was no sort of grey area there. Well, Clyde's one of those people who was, well, he's a, he was a genius in mm. his own way. Mm -hmm. And I've heard Technology genius, and you know he he chaired Mensa for a long time. Yes, and you did. can understand yeah. that that was all in his brain and so on. And mm -hmm. he he was he got to be very um, disappointed quickly with people because they didn't get what he was trying to get to. He right. was already at least two chapters ahead in the book of, for as far as they were concerned mm -hmm. and so on. Mm -hmm. And uh, and as I say, he um, you know he would throw a piece of paper over to Jim Westwood, and as far as Clive was going, they were already fine billion had already been sold, or gazillion had already been sold. <laughs> <laughs> and that, but that's, that's Clive, and that's, that's the inventor, and he was fantastic at that. And you look at the range of products that he, in, that he did, you know, starting under his bedclothes in, in his bed as a, as a young man, mm -hmm. you know, designing radios yeah. and amplifiers and all kinds of things, you mm -hmm. know, mm -hmm. and, and producing them. Yeah. He used to write for um, uh, Practical Wireless magazine exactly as well, so. didn't he? And, at, um, a, at a very, very young age. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. But then that gave him access to a whole range of, of um, transistor manufacturers. Um, exactly. And, and then, from what I understand, he was then talking to those transistors. And the, the, the production wasn't as good as it is today, so you'd have failures. Yeah. Um, or ones that didn't <laughs> quite come up to spec. And he was interested in those. Because although they didn't come up to the spec that those transistors were designed mm -hmm. for, they still had a use. Exactly. And if he could buy them cheaper um, and make a product based around those at the lower spec, um, you know, and it's something that he pulled off later on as well, isn't it, with the, with the spectrum, with the, the RAM chips that, that weren't quite up to spec, um, and then testing them and using them sort of one half in one and one in the other. Um, you know, it, it's, it's kind yeah. of genius, really. Absolutely. Because nobody <laughs> could touch the price of the spectrum because of the the ram chips you know he was yeah. getting them for price that nobody else could really understand how yes um you know and only later on yeah. you really yeah. you know you're buying sort of second rate ones but yeah. um yeah that because the, there's the there's the technology side of things and mm -hmm. obviously like, like you say i think he's a genius um but in the business <laughs> he he kind of gets put down a bit for the business side of things because there were these business failures and or mm -hmm. you know whichever way you want to put it but little tricks like that yeah. um or what you know, gave him that edge. Yeah, and I'd always say that Clive would back his ideas with whatever money he had himself. Yeah. So he would always put his own money behind things. Uh -huh. And that, um, you know, he made a lot of money out of selling 10% of Sinclair research at one stage. And, and most of that ended up going into the development of the C5. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, you know, he, he backed his ideas with his money. Yeah, he had <clears throat> absolute belief in it. Yeah. So, you know, it, it made sense to do yeah. that. There was, it couldn't fail. Like you say, you're going to sell a gazillion. Yeah. Um, so, uh, <clears throat> yeah, it does show you the, the drive. Um, and the belief that he had himself. Absolutely. Um, and he continued that belief and, you know, the, uh, what we see now as electric cars and so on. Clive would have been all over that. Absolutely. Uh, because he, he was totally behind, uh, electric bikes and mm -hmm. all of these things, you mm -hmm. know, and to, to today, you know, we look at uh, electric scooters yep. and electric cars and so on. Uh, they are only following 
clients lead. Yeah. And, you know, the C5 might look a bit odd these days, but for young people, had it been marketed differently, had he um, not tried to sell it on a uh, you know, November snowstorm <laughs> on Park Lane, he could have done well. And uh, it, uh, you know, for people in Cambridge, in, in the Netherlands, in Florida, and in Southern California, he would have sold as many as he expected he would sell in Britain. Mm. Yeah. <coughs> the media, personally, I think, I might be wrong, but were a little bit of the death knell for, for the C5 because they, they just destroyed it. Yeah. Um, and the QL, simply. Well, and the QL. yeah, yeah. Yeah. And yeah. I think Clive didn't and do it, himself any favours with this silly advert, you know, leaping over. And all I know, it was, I, yeah, it was silly. <laughs> I'm not sure it was actually that, that wrong because it got the attention. It did. That's true. But, uh, but yeah, a bit, a bit crazy. But that means it, 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 it's still showing today. I remember watching the speed image. You know, oh, I can't yes. remember who it was in the, but it was a drive in the cab, you know, and all of a sudden it, it goes up like that and he just pulls over to the side of the road, gets a sticker out and puts a thing on the side of his cab with a C5 with a line through it, yeah. like the old, you know, airplanes in World War II. Did he ever mention anything about that sort of stuff? Yeah, absolutely. S yeah. Because, like, um, yeah, yeah. Because but Bill positively or negatively? Yeah. I think he liked, I think he supported them. I think he put the money in for the first round of um, jokes or the scenes that they did. Really? He backed it. Yes, I don't know whether it was 10,000 or whatever else, but Bill Matthews, who was the finance director at the time, would know that. And certainly uh, Clive knew the, the guys behind Spitting Image. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And, and so, so he didn't he, mind he didn't that they mind. were ripping him? No, no. no. As far as I, he... It was probably, just publicity. He was, yes. It was his yes. name out there yes. in front of everybody again. yes. yes. Yeah, he probably wasn't that pleased with the way he was represented. But, <laughs> but he got yeah. him in front of everybody, yeah. and that was the main yeah. thing. That's really interesting. Because yeah. that takes a bit of a thick skin to, to, yeah. uh, to take that. Yeah, but um, he, was, he also was somebody who put money into the Royal Court Theatre, which was, you know... The other side of him was, you know, he was yeah. very much into his poetry, wasn't he? And, Absolutely. And, and, and it was a distraction from all this. It was something, Absolutely. the antithesis of, yeah. of something yeah. that was defined was, by logic and everything else. He was very much into... As we're saying, in, into arts. Yeah, yeah, classical and, music. Uh, yeah. Oh God, yeah. It, it's interesting. We were talking earlier um, about sort of maybe misjudging the market for some of these things. Mm. Um, that you, you, and I never thought about it, but um, but the C five just as a as a an entertainment, as a fun yeah. vehicle to drive around, mm. not necessarily on the road. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> and and I have done so, and they are great. You yes. know, the fifty mile an hour when you're that low to the ground feels a yeah. lot faster than fifteen yeah. mile an hour. <clears throat> um, and uh, and they were great. And the first time I ever experienced them um, was after um, you know the, the the they had stopped selling um, at, at some sort of country park somewhere where there was. 10, 15 of them, um, you could pay a pound and have a few laps of the circuit. And they were brilliant, absolutely yeah, brilliant. Absolutely. Only a few years later, um, you know, 10 years later or something, I can't quite remember, um, but you started seeing Japanese concept cars coming out that really looked like a C5. Absolutely. They were white, they were bubbly, yeah, yeah. you know, um, and uh, so, <coughs> so Clive really was ahead of the game on that, on that score. And, and like you say, the technology wasn't, well, wasn't quite up to it. So, so maybe he sort of <coughs> missed... Um, sort of judged the market. Um, well, he judged, I think, correctly that young people were light, were, didn't have a have a, a vehicle driving license for it, and mm -hmm. they could drive ride them. And so, you know, it was a young person's thing. And uh, you know, there is that may not have been enough money in around in the UK, but certainly in flat parts of the UK, and as I say, in the Netherlands and in Florida in particular, and and Southern California. There was lots of money available mm. for these things, and uh, it was it would have been a wonderful um, solution for yeah. this. But he decided it was a car, and that was the problem. He want he saw it as a car, and he had ideas about doing um, multiple occupant vehicles and so on. Yeah, and, there were going to be later yeah, versions, yeah, wasn't yeah, there? The yeah, C10 yeah. and 15 yeah. and whatever. And uh, you know that was. The technology wasn't quite there mm. at that point. Mm. Yeah, uh, in the same way with this um, with this portable computers, um, we yeah. know, we spent a long time trying to do uh, um, lenses and uh, mirrors and so on to do portable computers, and mm. none of them would work. Right. I remember Guy Cuny, who was the uh, editor of uh, 
PCW at that stage, yeah. post-person computer world, came up once and, and he shook his head and said, I think he's a bit mad on this one. Because <laughs> <laughs> there was no way that these, um, that these uh, optical solutions would work. Yeah. And in the end, you know, there was a, the Z88 was a very good eight-line um, computer. Yeah, that really was. <laughs> yeah. That really was. And, and people come into the museum um, you know, to, to donate and, and, and they tell us these stories of how long they were using those things for, yeah. you know, beyond yeah. the time that they, you know, outlived, uh, their normal life. Uh, and, uh, the battery life was excellent and, and they were very, very usable. Yeah. You know, he was all very, uh, down on the liquid crystal displays that were out at the time. Um, and, and he was right. They weren't very good. Yeah. Um, super twist technology, which was terrible. <laughs> um, that Amstrad used on their, uh, um, PPC computer. Yeah. There's interviews with him online about the, the, uh, portable computer that would be forthcoming. Yeah. Um, the following year, uh, from the, from the QL, I believe. Um, and he was saying, oh, we have our own technology and it's better than the, you know, um, I, I'm guessing that that was kind of based on the idea of you've got the flat screen, uh, yes. idea with the tube Absolutely. and bending it around so it was fairly yeah. flat, but then just increasing that with some, yes. some way, yes. either with some sort of lens or a yes. bigger version of it. Yes. But and it just never happened. And that, just didn't work. Yeah. So the flat screen display was, as we all know, is, is the solution. Uh, but at that stage, no, you're right. He um, he believed it was all in optics and mm. it would be on mirrors and uh, right. and lenses. Was there any form of the portable computer oh, yes. ever take place? It, oh it, yes, many. Really? Yes. Where, are, where are they then? Yeah, um, I need them. <laughs> well, you know that, uh, that you know when uh, Sinclair moved from Willis Road, mm. moved out to Milton Hall um, in uh, Milton. Mm -hmm. North of here, um, there was yeah, there were a number of people working in on that uh, on, in that portable area. And, right. Uh, okay. Yeah, coming out, and I I have no idea what happened. Yeah. Um. So uh, back with with mm. is is temperament. I mean, were you ever on the receiving end of? I of... was once. Oh. Yes. One of the things we decided to do was because our distributors in the main markets in uh, Europe were not well um, supported financially, that we were constrained by the number of sales we could make, uh, and whether it was in France, Germany, Italy, or, or Spain. Spain, Telefonica did, uh, uh, did, its, uh, did its own uh, version, um, but the others were a little bit strapped with cash. So uh, uh, we decided we'd set up our own independent companies in these uh, areas. And so we uh, worked around our distributors in those markets and financed the uh, uh, a stock that we had in those countries. And unfortunately, we made a bit of a mistake in, in Germany. And uh, that's another long story, which is inappropriate for today for me <laughs> to talk about. Uh, but that uh, blew into a major problem. Right. And uh, I remember sitting with Clive one day. And it was one time when Clive did lose it with me. And I can only tell you it was a bit like being screamed at by somebody who was like a bird, was flying around the ceiling, yelling at me. <laughs> and I, that was one of the most uncomfortable moments of my life. Really? But I have to say that, as other people have said about Clive, he would get it off his chest and it was over. Yeah. He, yeah. you know, he concentrated what lots of people go over several days about. It was all over in, you know, a couple of minutes. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and it was unbelievably uncomfortable at the time. <laughs> But at but, least relatively short. Yeah. 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 So right. yeah, that was, that was my one experience. Right. But, but, you know, other people had their own personal experiences. No, absolutely. Um, I mean, Chris Carrier says uh, similar <laughs> things, you know, that there, there would, there would be a, uh, an eruption. Um, <laughs> you'd all sit there and you'd all take it, um, because there is no point in trying to, to yeah. fight it. Um, woe yeah. betide well, with the, a did. The, the difference is when you're the only person. Well, yes. Yeah. 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 Then you've got the full force of it. That must be pretty uncomfortable. <laughs> Yeah. Like a force of nature, <laughs> but but like you say, it was all over, and then you're, yes. you're back to being friends and, and colleagues, and yeah. let's solve this problem exactly and and, so. uh, uh, and crack on, which is you know in, in some ways, yeah, well, it's, everything's got its you know balance, hasn't it? So it's uh, yeah, yeah, no, no, go he was that, a, he was a new, you know he. Um, as I say, you you only have to look at his parents to understand yeah. how. Um, 
Clive can be this combination of generosity and um, irascibility, shall we mm. say. <laughs> I mean, it, it's also a trait of uh, that kind of person. I mean, mm. you know, you can you can compare um, with people like Steve Jobs, uh, you know, yeah, that, that sort of thing. Absolutely. Somebody that is that driven um, to create something that other people don't even know they need yet. Yes. You know, which he did multiple times. Yeah. Um, you know, you have to have that belief in yourself. You have to have very clear yeah. vision. You, of, you, nice people don't make successes. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That's a, that is also said. Um, yeah, that explains how my life has worked out. Um, but, uh, but yeah, absolutely. But but he he did have a a, a, a reasonable balance to it, so that you know the, there was also and, and, and with great generosity, as yeah. you say, you know, Clive in the Stone House we used to have um, Christmas parties there, and they were extraordinary. Oh, I was going to ask about the Stone House parties; yeah. these are legendary. Oh, they were. I went to a couple of them there, and they were unbelievable. They were beautifully staged. With um, I, I just remember one in particular. You know, everything was blacked out and so on with the, the uh, beautiful lighting and the, the food was fabulous and so you know everybody who you never you would never expect to see it at a, at a party was there you know right. like people from you know politics and from business and so on you know would be coming to a Clive Christmas party that was uh, <laughs> special <laughs> it sounds like it they're, they're, Nobody says a great deal about them. This is what's intriguing me because we know that they're lavish. We know that they're they're special. Um, I think know. they were probably lost into the mists of alcohol. <laughs> Fair enough. That makes sense. That does make sense. Okay, I won't push any further. Um, but so so you were at Sinclair from eighty three, and eighty three yeah. was the year that he received a knighthood, wasn't it? It was, yeah. Did that happen while you were there? It, yes, it exactly. Did. Yeah. And, and how yeah. did you find out? What was the... What, the, what was the, I probably heard the from Nigel first, right. yeah. And yeah. what was the feeling like around oh, the company? Fantastic, yeah. yeah. It was a complete... Uh, well, it was unexpected, but um, we were all probably a bit surprised that he had this relationship with Margaret Thatcher because mm-hmm. he was uh, Margaret Thatcher in her unique way, you know, really um, had this... Um, Pension for for Clive, shall we say? Mm, mm-hmm. That makes sense, though. I mean, she was yeah. all about you know yeah. the entrepreneurship, Successes, yeah, um, yeah, Absolutely. and and, uh, and yeah. that side of things. Um, there's a there's a piece of footage, isn't there, with her showing the Sinclair Spectrum off yes. um, to uh, overseas visitors, and it was all about that side of things. So that that does make sense. Yeah, um, and I think you know Clive probably fitted that era pretty well. Um, you know, for 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 better and it was, or for worse. It was inspiring for all of the young people that are getting their ZX eighty ones and uh, Spectrums and so on. And uh, you know, the boss of the company got knighted for his efforts, mm-hmm. and that was that was fantastic. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Did you see a change in him at all after that? No, because I don't. Didn't get didn't go to his no, head. No, 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 not at all. Right. No, I, I'm sure he appreciated it. Oh yeah. Um, yeah. Elon Musk recently uh, was uh, was very congratulatory of him, and of course we sold um, sold our products in South Africa, mm-hmm. and I'm uh, sure that's where he uh, he first encountered uh, what would have been a Spectrum, probably. Yeah. So um, let's talk a little bit about the the, the Spectrum in in particular, mm. um, because you know the, the Spectrum, as it would turn out, would be yeah. a great machine yes. um, <clears throat> to play games on. Okay, something that Clive was not happy yes. about. Am I right? Yeah, yeah, you're right. Yeah. Well, f- f- two things about it. First of all, thanks to Rick Dickinson, who is the designer who came up with the little chevron of mm-hmm. the multi, uh, the, uh, the colors of rainbow the colors rainbow colors. Yeah. yeah, which is brilliant. Yep. It, it lifted the whole product dramatically. And then, yeah, um, mainly to Clive Chagrin, it, it wasn't a business computer, although lots of people used it for business. Mm-hmm. It was a games computer and that's where somebody called Alison McGuire who was the software manager in uh, in Sinclair did a fantastic job she was the champion of everything that uh, was done in the on the games playing side right. and uh, you know with with people like David Potter David Potter was you know uh, hungry Horace and all these or so Horace goes skiing and all these uh, uh-huh. things the four programs for the QL and also chess, which was one yeah. of the things which uh, was a big success story. Mm-hmm. And it was, you know, you have to think that, yes, some y- mainly young men were doing programming, but vast majority of them were sitting in their bedrooms with their 
TVs um, and their tape recorders and loading up uh, games yeah. and having great fun with them. Absolutely. I mean, for a lot of them, you know, a lot of us didn't have TVs in our bedroom. We had to sort yeah, exactly. of borrow, exactly. beg exactly. to use the TV exactly. in the living room. Yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> and, uh, you know, your parents would miss University Challenge or whatever. Um, it, you know, and of course, it, all, all young stuff. people were saying, oh, yes, I'm doing my homework now. Yeah, of course. I, I need, of I need course. the television because I've got some programs to work through yeah. and so on. Yeah, yes. yeah. And that's why the parents bought them the, the machines in the first exactly place to do their so, homework. Yeah. I mean, that's one of the, the biggest fallacies of, of all of the... <laughs> Not just Sinclair, but all home computing at that time. Yeah. Um, but, but a great one. I mean, it's 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 interesting. I mean, so uh, you talk about Alison then. I mean, yeah. how was that department or whatever even allowed to exist if, if Clive well, hated the idea of these I machines? I would imagine that it was probably Nigel Searle that right, uh, okay. had that uh, very good relationship with Alison and, uh, and, and you know, it's a, someone at the sharp end of selling products. And uh, you, we weren't shy saying that this is fantastic. We, we sold lots of computer games as bundles with the yeah. with the computer, yeah. and that was really good. And that, of course, you have to look around today, and mm. <laughs> it's and what everybody does. Huge <laughs> numbers of of, uh, of games, uh, the, and and that's an interesting thing as well because it's not, you know, the legacy of this is not just about you know Sinclair and those machines. It yeah. is all the other industries. That, that were born around it to support yeah. it. Yeah, the, yeah. the people producing <clears throat> peripherals, um, the, the software houses, you know, the, the bedroom coders. Um, yeah. You know, it's and it's this isn't a story necessarily about Sinclair. I mean, it's a, all home computers yes. at that time. Um, but actually, you know, the, the Sinclair Spectrum was yeah. specifically you know the the games machine, and therefore did. Yeah. Get a lot of people. It was a, it was, a, it was a great vehicle for all of these peripherals. Mm. That uh, whether it be uh, memory peripherals or whether it uh, be joysticks for games yeah. controllers and so on and so forth. Yeah. And, and of course, um, tape recorders to load the uh, the programs. Yeah, with. yeah, yeah. Because tape recorders became yeah. data recorders, didn't they? Yeah. They, they, they were kind of just rebranded. Absolutely. Uh, yeah. Dixon's would yeah. sell yeah. their same you know, cassette deck. You, you, you can't tell young people today. But if you listen to a tape recorder loading the the program, you know, yeah. you know that's a, something that everyone remembers. You yeah. Know? Oh, they do here. They do here. Yeah. <laughs> um, but um, so so you know, when you look at the legacy of of these machines, um, it is far more wide-reaching than than just the Sinclair Absolutely. Uh, machines you know it's all those other companies that were inspired yeah. to, to start up to support it yeah. um, and those companies that went on to do well I think great everybody things. wanted to em emulate what Clive had done they mm. saw Clive's success and said well we can do that mm. that is great that's on enterprise as entrepreneurs and that's exactly why Cambridge is the way it is today because you've got you know two uh, organization you've got Sinclair and you've got Acorn, uh, both of which did extraordinarily well, and that both had their own um, inventors behind them. You mm -hmm. know? Yeah, uh, absolutely, <laughs> absolutely. So let's let's talk a little bit more about Cambridge then. So um, you're the man behind the Cambridge phenomenon, mm. uh, and uh, I'm, I'm basically documenting uh, this great diagram. Um, was it Siegel Quince? Yeah, the, the original, Wixley, the, yes, they, they, were the first, they came up with the first Cambridge Phenomenon right. book, which so, was in 1985. So this is about um, Cambridge University right in the middle of it, um, and then this circular map of all these companies that have come out yeah. and their internal relationships and things like that, and then you've taken that and taken it further <laughs> with the more recent um, uh, sort of things that have, have been developed within Cambridge. Um, so going to the, the 80s, it's interesting that you that you think you mentioned at the beginning um, of, of Clive, you know, possibly being one of the first entrepreneurs, you know, mm -hmm. um, and and I hadn't quite thought of it that way. Mm -hmm. uh, you kind of think that entrepreneurs have been around forever, and, and in many ways they have. Um, but putting that label on them and recognising them yeah. as somebody like that, then Clive was one of the yeah. the very well. Early if you ones. Matthew Bullock, who was behind the uh, Cambridge the first Cambridge Phenomenon book, uh, Siegel Quincy Wixty mm -hmm. version, uh, was the one that um, came up with the concept of. Cambridge phenomenon. If you go back to 1980, you see in a um, in a, an article in in the Times or was it the Financial Times? I can't remember. One of them was um, came up with the words um, 
Cambridge and phenomenon in the same sentence. Right. And uh, as a result of that, Matthew Bullock came up with the uh, Cambridge phenomenon. And Matthew d- was the guy that uh, was um, the in Barclays Bank and right. saved both Sinclair and um, Acorn mm-hmm. <laughs> because right. he persuaded the bank to support them through their difficulties. And that's when I, I first met uh, Matthew in, I guess, like 1984 or 85 or something when he he came in to uh, um, talk to Clive and uh, offer them money, as it was yeah. in those mm-hmm. days. So, uh, But it was Matthew who came up with that, and he was the one who got the um, entrepreneurs in Cambridge together in the, in the end of the 1970s, early 1980s. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's what drew Clive to Cambridge, isn't it? Uh, it well, no, he came to Cambridge to work with uh, Cambridge consultants, right. because uh, Tim Eilowart and David Southard, who were the founders of, uh, of Cambridge consultants, Consultants um, were people that uh, that Clive knew, and uh, he right. certainly was attracted to them. And then David Southard um, ended up working with Clive in in Sinclair Research. Mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. you know, I knew David from from the get go, and right. uh, you know, uh, Clive had some very very talented. Uh, engineers and scientists around him, and of course the other one would be uh, would be Jim Westwood. And Jim yes. was wonderful, as we've said already. You know, mm. Clive's ideas were on the back of a piece of paper or a fag packet or whatever else, and <laughs> he would literally fling them across the road to Jim, and and Jim would figure out how to make it and so on. And he's <laughs> one of you know the most um, under. Uh, estimated people in in Cambridge, mm-hmm. and, and Alison, in her way, on the software side, was was similar. That uh, I don't know whether Clive spent any time worrying about software and so on. Right, <laughs> mm-hmm. not at all. He no. just just no, didn't come did, up. And... No, no, not really. And, right. and and as you know, Clive didn't use computers. No. Clive had a had a cylindrical slide rule, mm-hmm. and uh, you know if you, if you did his if you spun out his slide rule, be a slide rule this long <laughs> and so on. So he made a, had a cylindrical one and yeah. put it in his pocket, and that's when he did all his calculations. Right. <laughs> it is said um, that that you know even you know for a long time after he, he wouldn't have technology computers around no. because they were a distraction from. His thought processes and, and coming up with ideas. Well, he'd and probably do it, do it in his head. You mm. know, he'd do, do most of the calculations that he needed in his head, whether they were right or wrong, I don't know. Probably more of them were wrong mm. <laughs> because of the, when he threw, threw the, uh, uh, the fag packet across to, to Jim Westwood, there were probably all kinds of mistakes in there, but Jim would overrule them, you know, and so on. <laughs> then the only point when Clive and Jim would get together would be when Clive would say, well, we, we made, we could make, improve the reliability if we made this into this. <laughs> no, that's more expensive. <laughs> Don't do it. <laughs> yeah, it, it, yeah. Uh, lots of things did come down to yeah. price. Yeah, um, absolutely. And he had these, Prices in his head. He's mm. a forty-nine ninety-five, eighty-nine, so ninety-nine ninety-five, and then one twenty-nine, one forty-nine, one yeah. etc. You know, yeah. that was those are the key price points. For yeah. Him. yeah, yeah. He knew that the, the yeah. being sub, yeah, and a level made he, him more attractive. He would always have a view as to what the um, uh, what the advert would look like. Mm-hmm. You know, mm-hmm. he wouldn't have a clear idea about what he wanted in the advert, and there's lots of technical information in them. Mm-hmm. Because that's, yeah, that's, that's what the, um, the the young people wanted. They wanted to read about it, and they yep. wanted to know what they were buying. Yeah, that probably changed over time, maybe because yes. when when you yeah. were looking at the amplifiers and that sort of thing, yeah. they were sold very much to Absolutely. somebody that had an engineering kind of yeah. head or electronics head on them. Um, and then later on, um, you know, if you were trying to advertise to the masses. You know, these were people yeah. that, that but people wanted used to, know to the other, yeah. you know the the if you look at the ZX80 had one K of RAM. Mm. You know, the ZX81 had two K of RAM, mm. and uh, you know, Spectrum had sixteen K. You know, and he had a had a had a RAM pack. You know, which was you know forty eight K. You know, yeah. and this is what people and young people used to talk about. It was how it was. How much it was all RAM about the memory. Yeah, you know? so I think the, the ZX80 <laughs> and the 81 both had one K of memory. Okay, fine. Um, yeah. And the the just just so that everybody yeah, yeah, no, change no, all. Um, the the Spectrum and that and they could have a RAM pack. Yeah. Uh, which is another whole story in itself yeah. with the with the RAM pack wobble. Um, I suffered from that. 
Um, well, my ZX81 did. Uh, the uh, and the Spectrum had 16k of memory, and then and yeah. the option to buy the 48k model. Um, and and it was you're right. These things were sold on how many oh, k's yeah. your computer had. Absolutely. Um, and the and the, the Spectrum, the 48k Spectrum, had 16k more than a BBC yeah. Micro at 399 pounds. Yeah. So yeah. it did seem like a. And a I, re I remember when obvious uh, when Bill Gates came along and said, you know, you won't want anything that's more than uh, you know um, 64. Mm. God, so 640. Or yeah, yeah like, later on, he said. Yeah, yeah. and, and yeah. you know, we all say, oh my God, that's so big, you know. Yeah. <laughs> he claims never to have said that, though. Uh, um, but, I, you know, well, okay. Uh, yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, but, but, uh, but uh, no, it's, it's quite interesting. Yeah, that those, those figures, those, those things that allowed you to measure one computer against exactly. another well, were really important. With the lowest, um, it was kind of like the highest common else? factor rather than the lowest common denominator. Yeah. So. Yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah, absolutely. Um, and it's interesting as well because you look at the, the marketing for the Spectrum, and as much as it was a great machine for playing games on, yeah. that never featured in the advertising. Um, it was always you know, like a graph yeah. on the screen and, and the yeah. idea of some young yeah. person doing their Well, homework. I think there was some kidology in this as well. I don't know whether the advertising agency we used to was extraordinarily good. Um, you uh, understood the difference between what young people wanted and what their parents wanted mm. them to do. Mm. So there was a sort of a, you know. <laughs> yeah, well, you market to the parents. Yeah, they're the ones yeah. with the money. Yeah. Uh, they're the ones who are going to yeah. buy it. And, you know, there was a bit of kidology. You know, yeah. I'm doing my homework. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and, and you know, it, it, there was very much at that time um, this whole um, sort of push to get uh, you know kids, well, everybody, give them an understanding of what computers could be. Absolutely, because yeah. we have to remember that you know pre nineteen eighty or nineteen seventy nine, seventy seven, whatever, around that time. Computers weren't really in the home. Very few uh, homes had a computer in them. And if you thought of a, the, the term computer, you imagine the James Bond stuff, the, you know, the big tape drives and yeah. the flashing yeah. lights and the, the switch panels and things like that. That's what computers were to people. Yeah. Um, and they were very you know, domineering and, and scary potentially to, to people. Um, so the idea of a computer in your home had to be sold in a, in a way that was going to be <coughs> beneficial um, yeah. and that benefit yeah. To what my pe most people saw was to educate, yeah. you know, their well, my, kids. My eldest son was uh, you know, between the sort of the ages of um, uh, nine and eleven or something like that, eight and eleven, um, was you know of that age group. Mm. And I used to take all the games home with me and so on. And he used to sit in his room and with his tape recorder and record all these things. And he loved it. He yeah. absolutely he loved it. Of course. Yeah. Yeah. I was eleven when I had the X eighty one, and. Uh, yeah, I, I can remember having that machine, and and uh, and one of the games was um, you know three D Monster Maze, which yes. which go down in history because you know it's yeah. it's really hard to get across to anybody that that wasn't of that age at that time. That's right. Just how much of a game that was, and how kind of scary it was, which sounds silly because at the end of the day, you've got these very very blocky pixelated characters on the screen. But I kind of equate it <coughs> quite a lot with like literature. If you you know if you read a story, it's all up here. Yeah. You yeah. make those exactly. things appear in your head exactly. in the way that is probably the most yeah. scariest to you or whatever yeah. it might be. Yeah. Um, and those games were the same. Uh, there's this kind of middle ground where you've got what's on the screen and then what you see and what goes in is Absolutely. is a bit different well, you think when about, you're 11. Think about this first one, which was Pong, you know. Yeah. With <laughs> yeah. And, and everyone's played Pong, you yeah. know, everyone. Not these days, but people... Grew up with even Pong. today, yeah. even today, yeah. you know, and and it's still as playable game as it ever was. Yeah. Um. But uh. But yeah, the 3D one. Okay, wasn't it wasn't 3D in the way that we know it today? And and the, but it was still something that was quite amazing. I remember that, and I remember Flight Simulator. Those were two oh, games. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Um. The Flight Simulator. Yeah. You know, you look at it now and you think, really? Yeah. You know, you yeah. spent time on this. Well, you see the. Um, and I know we're off off subject now, but now, you see the latest Microsoft oh, yeah. Flight Simulator. It's unbelievable. Yeah. And yeah. they've they've got um, you know views of every single airport mm. in the world, and <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it's just incredible. Absolutely, yeah. but you know, but to me, um, you know, I haven't played you know Microsoft Flight Simulators uh, of late, or hardly ever. Mm. Um, but I did play that one on, on yeah. my 16K ZX81 with its RAM pack. Absolutely, um, kept it stable <laughs> enough so that it didn't wobble. Um, <laughs> I was very delicate on the keys when playing the game, um, otherwise it'd crash. But um. But I, but I did, and uh, there was this kind of horizon that, that kind of blockily moved, and yeah. and then in my head, I was flying an airplane. You know, this was incredible yeah. because uh, <laughs> at that time, um, computers 
So, sorry, no, te televisions showed you what the TV companies wanted to show you, right? Yeah. You had to be in front of that TV at a certain time and you got fed whatever it was. That, for me, personally, that was one of the first times that my TV showed me something that I had any kind of say on. So I decided I wanted to play the flight simulator and it was amazing. I flew a, yeah. an airplane through my ZX81. Um, or I would sit down and I'd write some code and I'd make it do exactly what I wanted it to do. Yeah. You know, and, and for an 11 year old at that time, you know, if you think about it, you know, you, you're, you're at home and you're told what to do by your parents. Didn't like that much. You go to school and you're told what to do by teachers. Yeah. Didn't like that much either. Um, but the computer, I could tell it what to do and it would do it, you know, un, unerringly. You, you would put those commands in and it would do them <clears> exactly <throat> as you said. That to me was something that, that clicked. And, you know, I, I don't Absolutely. know what it says about the, the, <clears throat> your psyche or whatever, but, um, it was amazing. It, it did. It opened up an entirely new world, yeah. and I can't imagine being born at any other time. Um, I, I don't know what I would have done if I was born ten years earlier. I have no idea. No. Um, but there was. I don't think there was anything ten years before that I would have been interested in. No, no, I, the I, computer. I, yeah, was everything. Yeah, and and for me, um, flight simulator is a kind of moving that across to the fact that. Clive had his uh, aeroplane. He had a Cessna Conquest, right. which we used to uh, take people up to Dundee, where the um, Sinclairs were being manufactured at yep. the time. Mm -hmm. And I used it a lot because I used to go around Europe right. on this. I, as there was two New Zealand Air Force pilots and me sitting in the back do, doing lots of work, but flying around Europe. And uh, it was absolutely incredible. <laughs> yeah. So I spent a lot of my time in, in airplanes. Yeah. Uh -huh. <laughs> Amazing. It's, uh, it sounds something that would have, you know, that, that will stick with you forever. You know, that, that kind of experience absolutely. at that time. Yeah. It was such a crucial time. The yeah. sort of the early eighties, mid eighties, um, <clears throat> you know, was something where, where the UK, well, around the world, you know, took a, a different turn yeah. um, and took us to the world we have today. Yeah, well, I, I remember I used, when I was in the motor industry, I used to go to the, um, uh, every year there would be a um, car show and so on on that, uh, in, the, in, in, um, in Birmingham. Mm -hmm. And at the, no, what was it, the NEC in, in Birmingham, I yeah. think, yeah. And, uh, you know, that, that had lots of people various ages and so on. But then when I joined Sinclair, I went to the computer shows in London and they, you know, I was an old man then. I was like, I was, I think I was 36 when I joined Sinclair, you know, and most of the people that were working for Sinclair had an average age of, I don't know, 25, 26 right. or something like that. So mm -hmm. I, I always said that when I left British Leyland, the average age went up. <laughs> and when I joined Sinclair, the average age went up. <laughs> 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 and it was, but it was fantastic to be in that group of people in the, um, uh, in the, uh, where, where was it? In Olympia in, uh, in London. Right. Uh, the, these um, computer shows, yeah. they were fabulous. And yeah. they, we were absolutely inundated with people. They were so keen, you know, and the average age would have been, you know, younger than the average age of the people in Sinclair at that stage because yeah. they just wanted to be part of this new thing. Yeah. And that's, I think is the reason why Britain is the way it is in entrepreneurialism today. It, probably the closest you've got to that would be in in America, of course, but also in these days in China. Mm -hmm. yeah. <clears throat> and it's uh, it's just fascinating. <clears throat> it is. It is. So to to, to wrap up <laughs> a, a, a little bit, I mean, what what do you think Sir Clive's legacy is that we haven't already discussed? In terms of in terms of Cambridge, in terms of computing, um, you know, there there will never be another option. I I, I remember that kind of era and 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 yeah. equate it with the Beatles. You know, there can never be another rock and roll revolution. It, you know, no. and there can never be another home computer revolution. Um, it's done. We're now standing on the shoulders of giants, yes, like Sir Clive Sinclair, yes, um, and building from that. Yeah, um, you know, it's. For me, I think because it because it, I was at that age, a very impressionable age, and it just <clears throat> clicked with my mindset. Um, that, uh, that yeah, and I, I don't want to sort of um, put rose tinted glasses on because obviously the, yeah. you know, the the whole industry had its, <clears throat> had its struggles a bit later on, um, but they were just sort of never bit to be repeated times. Yeah, I I find myself exceedingly lucky because it 
it saved me from being in the automotive industry, which I <laughs> liked at the time, mm. but it was getting, I uh, uh, didn't agree with a lot of things that were happening in British Leyland. So, you know, I was res I say I was rescued by Nigel Searle and Clive Sinclair into, into Sinclair. And, uh, you know, as I say, Clive was enormously generous to me. And, uh, you know, I, uh, I have, still have a great relationship with Nigel Searle, who lives in Florida these days. Yeah. And, uh, you know, all the people that were around at the time, you know, whether it's Herman Hauser or Chris Curry and so on, I'm friends with. And mm. uh, that's what I like about Cambridge as well as, any, uh, apart from anything else, is that there is a, a, a tremendous camaraderie amongst amongst the people. You know, we there is a difference between the entrepreneurs in Cambridge and entrepreneurs anywhere else. And there's a difference about Cambridge. Um, it is a small, compact environment. And, you know, these days we don't bump into each other in pubs. But in those mm, days, mm. We, that was the case. You know, yeah. you'd bump into people in, in pubs and uh, that was part of it, you know. And it was small enough that you could pretty well guarantee to bump into someone you knew in the middle of Cambridge. Mm -hmm. And, you know, the Cambridge Blue and so on was the local watering house for, for Sinclair people and so on. And, uh, you know, we used to go to lunch at, uh, down Hills Road at a, at a restaurant called Panos, right. and it was run by a Greek guy. And we used to go in there at lunchtime, and Panos was the first Cambridge spy, I like to think, <laughs> uh, always in the sort of the tradition of Cambridge spies, because Panos would come over and he'd say, Chris Curry was in here yesterday. He want to know who he was talking to. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm sure he was doing the same thing to Chris oh, all the time. Chris went in there and so on. And that was, that was a lovely part of that existence was that uh, these sort of existences were going on. But, uh, and, and it all has to do with, you know, people that were attracted to computing, but attracted to Clive as an individual. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, that his name was something that I was aware of before I joined Sinclair. Right. And as I said right at the beginning, you know, I said to my wife, I think it might last three years because that was the history of uh, Sinclair's efforts. I'd, I want to do it for three years. Yeah. And the rest of those things is history. Fantastic. Yeah. <clears throat> Fantastic. How do, how do you see um, <laughs> Clive in comparison with some of those other entrepreneurs in Cambridge? Because Cambridge uh, and Cambridge University, where, mm -hmm. where a lot of these, yeah. you know, there are some very, very clever people, but Clive was not one of those people. No, he he didn't go to university. No. Um, and you I know, think he would have been bored with the university. Yeah. I really do. I think that uh, although you know the um, computer department in, uh, in in Cambridge is, is first rate and there's been, or oh, best part of three hundred companies have spun out from yeah. the computer department in Cambridge, um, and you know you could envision that Clive, had he gone that way, would have been one of those people. But I think he would have been bored. I think right. he would have been, he wanted to do his own thing. And yeah. the fact that he was out there and with the, with the, his electronic products and so on, that was Clive. That's mm. how he, that's how he grew up. Mm. And he didn't need, he didn't need a degree. He should have got an honorary degree. That's for sure. Mm. And I think that, uh, I'm surprised that Cambridge didn't give him an honorary degree. Um, cause he deserved one. Yeah, mm. absolutely. He's just one of those people that makes things happen. He yes. just does. Yes. Um, and, and when I sort of heard stories from, from Rodney, um, you know, I, d I did see a lot of similarities, you know, in the, in the way, I mean, I, I didn't go to university. I just wanted to get mm -hmm. out there and do things, electronics and make things and whatever. Um, and, uh, and I saw that, that sort of similarity and just to, to say, okay, um, I, I, I haven't, not to say you haven't thought it through entirely, but you haven't work this out to the mm -hmm. nth degree, but I know that there is something here, let's just crack on and do <clears> it, um, is something that, that sort of I, I, do, I really do sort in of in see. That, in that um, context, then you have to look at the people like Steve Jobs and Bill Gates, mm. who were somewhat, not, not exactly like Clive, but similarly driven people that did amazing things with their businesses. And, yeah, uh, absolutely. And they, they either left university or didn't go to university, no. you know? <laughs> absolutely. And that this is not any sort of <laughs> sort yeah. of say to say you shouldn't go to university at all. No, no. Um, but um, uh, but you're right. And with 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 Steve Jobs, um, and I think Clive. I think there is a there's there are a lot of similarities. Um, and I n know that you agree with this because I've read it. But 
you know, this whole idea of saying, well, the, I'm not going to do market research um, because the, the, the market doesn't know yeah. what I have in store sort of thing. So I'm going to develop the product and then present it to the market and the market will want it. Mm -hmm. um, both of those two individuals are very much that, that kind of yeah. uh, way of thinking. Um, and in some ways, when you think about the, the, these type of products and how new and how revolutionary they mm -hmm. were, you know, you can't really do market research on something like that because there's nothing to really compare it with back at that time. Yeah. Um, so those two together, and and I and I know that you think that that Sinclair could have been, you know, the, oh. the Apple, you know, for yeah, the UK. Yeah, very much you know? so. Yeah, and he, um, and he saw what Apple did as being his competition, and when mm -hmm. the ZX eighty three came out, we. We're very keen to launch the ZX83 before, or the QL, yeah. before um, the Apple Macintosh came out. We were one week ahead of them. And I w went round Europe with the only three QLs that were operational with a, um, I have to say, with a, a mini computer <laughs> as well <laughs> to demonstrate it around Europe. And, uh, that was, that was it. We did, we got fabulous uh, press from that. Yeah, um, yeah. and the rest, they say, is history, but, uh, the, the uh, Macintosh was an amazing product. And, yeah, no, and, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Absolutely. Uh, uh, but, but let's rewind a little bit there. Yeah. Um, what was underneath the, the desk? Uh, PDP 11. <laughs> right. So, so we have a QL on display. Yeah. Um, but underneath that display was a PDP 11. Is that true? I think so. Wow. Okay. I think so. I think you'll find that most of the launches were supported by that. Now, it probably needs somebody like Nigel Sell to confirm so for that the was detail, the case. Yeah. But, but it was certainly, uh, I don't think we wanted to, certainly with the QL, we didn't want to rely upon the, um, the, the product itself to do the demonstrations. Right. And of course the demonstration was fantastic because, you know, we had a suite of four software programs, mm. which is just like the Microsoft uh, Office yeah, computer yeah, Quill and, yeah, yeah, and Abacus. Right. Yeah, 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 yeah. Right, okay. That's, and that that's, was David Potter of, yeah. uh, of um, um, what's, uh, Scion. Scion, yeah, yes. Who yeah. did fantastic work. Mm -hmm. And uh, you're probably aware that uh, the, the, the operating system for the QL was done in-house by mm -hmm. a guy called Tony Tebby. Yep. Uh, but there was also a backup, um, GST. From a guy called uh, Fenton, someone Fenton, anyway. Right. Yeah. So we, you know, that was smart thing to do, and that was, I oh, think, yeah. that that was probably Nigel's decision. Mm -hmm. That uh, you know, D Tony was a one-off. There was one person writing the operating system. You know, and that's a bit much to expect. Yeah, from one single person. point of failure. Yes. You know, if something yeah. goes wrong, yeah. then everything is. So he a was. It was Jeff Fenton, yeah, right. from GST that came up with the alternative. In the event, we stuck with Tony Tebbins solution. Right. Interesting. Yeah. And, and, and you've got to think or realize that we're talking about a very small amount of time, really, in the grand scheme of things. God, yes. Yeah. You know, ZX80 in 1980. I know. Then ZX81 the next year. Yeah. Then the ZX82, i.e., the Spectrum yeah. Yeah, the yeah. next year. Yeah. Um, then the QL. <coughs> yeah. You know, it, yeah. This was a lot of machines coming oh, out. Oh, yes. Very, very short space. Today, I, I suppose you can equate it with phones. Mobile phones tend to do, you know, yeah. the, the annual thing. But, you know, it's, that was, Huge and how that happened, I don't yeah. know. Well, well, I suppose by playing tricks with PDP 11's help. One of the pieces of people that uh, was an influence on uh, was Sinclair was Adam Osborne, who made the mistake of announcing the uh, his replacement Osborne before the previous one, mm -hmm. uh, before it was available. Yeah, and he kind of completely um, confused the marketplace with the Osborne and so on and, and went out of business and, and Clive, Clive and Nigel were absolutely um, convinced that they weren't going to go down that same yeah way, no same. with with hindsight now the the Adam Osborne and the the, uh, the whole Osborne thing there was that was a bit more complicated because <laughs> the, the company had other issues as well it wasn't that's just true. about that's true. Uh, the, that's true. but that story is an excellent story that that we use um, because it's an important one, yeah. you know, if you tell yeah. um, your customers what's coming out next and how powerful it's going to be, they're not going to buy the current yeah. one. They'll, they'll yeah. wait. And there's some, there um, some great computer stories around that time because Jack Tramiel was the mm -hmm. guy that came up with Commodore mm -hmm. and the Commodore, the um, Commodore 64 and so on was, yeah. was, a, was a big competitor. And uh, when there was a lovely story about um, when, com when um, Jack Tramiel left Commodore, 
um, he was asked a question about uh, the computer and he said, not only am I not going to answer that question, I'm not even allowed to hear it according to my lawyers. <laughs> <laughs> Well, indeed, indeed, because, you know, there was so much riding on these things. Oh, yes, yeah, You know, absolutely. it is the future of the company rides yeah. on your next yeah. product. Yeah, yeah. Um, so, yeah, I would imagine very, very difficult, time, very high-pressure times yeah. to, to be developing something so new, yeah. so revolutionary, um, and, and, you know. Yeah. yeah, so we grew up with the Ataris and the Commodores, of course, mm -hmm. and uh, I think it was the guy who, who was behind the Atari. Um, uh, Nolan Bushnell. Nolan Bushnell, yeah. 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 Uh, so uh, and I, I had the pleasure to meet Nolan oh, really? quite a number of years later. Yes, right. he he um, he ran a restaurant mm -hmm. in um, Santa Clara, yep. which is where my company that I was developing at the time uh, was based. And uh, yeah, I had a lovely talk with with him, and we and of course that that's still around today. Atari is mm -hmm. still around today. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> yeah. Uh, a bit of a different company than it yes, used of to course, be, yeah. but yeah, yeah. No, absolutely. Yeah, and Nolan was a, a was a real character. Yeah, he's and larger that's, than life. That's that's the wonderful thing. You you think about these people, and you know whether it's Nolan Bushnell or Steve Jobs or Clive Sinclair, they were all larger than life yeah. characters. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> yeah, and Clive even went. I wouldn't say that step further because I think they probably all did it through their publicists and things. But, mm. you know, the whole Uncle Clive thing, you know, uh, just to yeah. ingratiate himself with yeah. the general public because yeah. you're buying into Clive. Yeah. You're not buying the machine. Absolutely. You're buying into Clive's company. Absolutely. Um, and, you know, when if you were a, a Sinclair owner, you, you probably didn't change. You carried on through the Sinclair Absolutely products. Absolutely so. Um, yeah. Because you wanted to, yeah. you know, the next yeah. great it's, thing it's from Uncle Clive. It's about you know, and, and I have to say that I... I went from Sinclair into Apple right. and, you know, I'd been an Apple user ever since. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, whew, the, the um, Microsoft PCs and so on, when we, I think I was probably in a company where I had to use one at one stage, but right. it, was, it, was, it was a dreadful experience. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> I'm not going to make any comment on that. Uh, <laughs> great stuff. Uh, I really appreciate you taking the time no, today to come and chat well, with you us. you know, it's one of my favourite um, subjects. <laughs> so, yeah, and we and will was, be hearing more from you as well you. in the and future. I, and uh, I think I, you know, really was was very sad to hear about Clive because yeah. uh, he was totally a one-of-a-kind person. And Absolutely. He was just such a, yeah, a, a very generous guy for me and just an inspiration. Mm. You know, there are very, very few people who are going to inspire you. And he inspired my career. So, uh, yep, I, mine too, for sure. Um, and, and many, many other people's. Yeah. It is, it's a, it's a, a sad time. Um, and, uh, yeah, but he will remain an inspiration to us all. Absolutely. Thank you very Thank much you. for your time. Thank you. My pleasure. Thanks Thank a lot. you.